This is Twit. Okay, so this is another uh, of those episodes where I've recently received so many great feedback questions from our listeners that we have basically have a listener-driven podcast. Um, but lots of lots to say about some of the things that they brought up. John May, he sent me an is it an X that he sent me, Leo? I hate that. Maybe I got an X from John May. Anyway, it's actually a tweet, but don't tell Elon. He said, Steve, I've been watching SN since I retired from my IT job in 2020. In this week's episode three, uh, 936, so that was last week, he said, you talked about HTTP going the way of the dodo. If Google has their way, what about on private subnets that cannot be routed over the Internet? Why pop a message or hinder access if the traffic is staying local? I have many local devices I access via HTTP and don't want to add certificates. Hopefully these will be exempt. And he said, glad 999 is not the end. Okay, so yes. You know, the reason we need the encryption and authentication that TLS provides to HTTPS on the Internet is that the flow of packet traffic between the endpoints is out of our control on public networks and potentially exposed to the whims of bad guys. But that's not the case within a closed private network where the network components and all packet transit are local, typically kept within a single residence. As our local devices, such as routers, network attached storage, webcams, home assistants, and other IoT gadgets have become more capable, the traditional control panels, you know, filled with lights and buttons and switches, have all been replaced by web pages published by a simple web server running in the device. And this is the point that John May is making. I'm sure many of us has ha have had to fight with our web browsers when we wish to connect to a local router or other web interface over a simple HTTP connection. As John May worries, Google appears to be poised to make this somewhat more difficult in the future, maybe to the extent of saying no more HTTP. I think that's probably going too far. We'll see. Now, one solution would be to set policy based upon the distinction between publicly routable and private non-routable network IPs. And to be clear, when we're talking about non-routable IPs, we're talking about the three networks defined in the early days of the Internet, much to the credit of its early designers, because they had so much foresight, which were specified by RFC 1918, <laughs> a low-numbered RFC from the beginning. The most common that we all see when we're behind a consumer router is the address range that begins with 192.168. You know, uh, actually it's 192.168.0.0 extending through 192.168.255.255. And that's a group of 65536 IPs. Though for consumer use, we usually keep the third octet fixed typically at a zero or a one and use the 256 IPs by changing the last, you know, rightmost lower octet. In addition to the 192.168/16 network, which has been defined by that RFC, it also specifies a private network which is 16 times larger than that one, which goes from 172.16 through 172.3 three one and the third and final one is 16 times larger than that one so it's 256 times larger than the 192.168 network and that's the one that consists of all IPS beginning with 10 dot and you know then all three of, of the other octets fall within that 10 dot network so yes because none of those will be routed over the internet it would be tempting to have browsers willing to simply trust all connections to or from ips within those three private ranges and allow http connections there but doing so would mean that we trust every ip within that range 
In a small residential setting, that probably makes sense. But many large corporations also use these same large private network ranges internally for their intranets. And in such settings, access to raw network traffic is probably not well protected. You know, there's like, you know, networking closets around where it's easy to tap into the network flow. Um, so eavesdropping over those networks becomes feasible and widely allowing HTTP across large corporate networks would probably be extending trust too far. We typically don't have such security concerns within a small local network, but adopting a general browser policy of not requiring TLS connections for private networks might be too permissive since not all private networks are, as we know, fully trusted. Fortunately, a middle ground that probably makes sense is the use of a self-signed certificate. As we know, publicly trusted certificates are signed by a certificate authority that the web browser already trusts. So the browser inherently trusts any certificates that any of its already trusted certificate authorities have signed. Which brings us to the question, who has signed those certificate authority certificates which it already trusts? It turns out that in every case, the certificate authority has signed its own certificate. Uh, certificate, certificate authority root certificates are self-signed and they're trusted simply because they've been placed into the browser's root certificate store. And in turn, that means that nothing prevents an appliance like a router or a NAS from creating and signing its own certificate. When connecting over HTTPS with TLS, the first time a browser encounters a self-signed certificate, it will typically balk complain and say to its user, hey, uh, this guy is trying to pawn off a self-signed <laughs> certificate, which naturally wasn't signed by anyone I already trust. What should I do? Do you want me to trust it? To, wh to which the user can reply, yes, trust this certificate from now on. The procedure varies from browser to browser and by version, but basically the self-signed certificate gets added to the browser's internal store of trusted root certificates, and from that point on, it will be possible to establish regular TLS HTTPS connections with encryption and a limited level of authentication. I say that it's a limited level of authentication since as long as the device in question keeps the private key of the certificate it created to itself, no other device on the network or anywhere else for that matter can impersonate it. The user's web browser will have stored and been told to trust the, the web serving devices matching public key. That's what gets stored in the root store, the public key. So if the user's connection were to ever be intercepted by some other device, there's no way for that other device to reuse the trusted device's public key since it would never have access to its matching private key. So you do get a level of authentication even using a self-signed certificate. As long as the entity which, which created that self-signed certificate doesn't let go of its private key. Many years ago, I used OpenSSL to create a self signed certificate with an expiration date 100 years in the future. <laughs> I did, and I did that because I didn't want to be hassled by the need to keep updating mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my own self-signed yeah, certificate that's fair. At, you know, as it would expire. And it worked great at the time. I've not tried to do that recently, and I'm wondering, maybe somebody knows and will let me know, whether today's nanny browsers would complain that the certificate's expiration date oh, yeah. is too far in the future. Yeah. Remember that, you know, 
and maybe self-signed certificates are allowed to be exceptions. Um, but we know that web certs now can only be valid for up to 13 months in the future. So maybe the day of creating a 100 year life self-signed cert is over. In any event, for now, we're able to tell our browsers to trust um, local HTTP connections. So, you know, they're not happy about it, but they'll do it. In Firefox, for example, I get a red slash across the padlock yes. when I click connect to my local Asus router or my local Synology NAS. But when I connect to my local PFSense firewall router, the little padlock shows an exclamation point. And if I drill down, like click on the padlock, then, then, then you know, in Firefox, and then, and then say, like, show me more, um, I, I get a pop-up. And, th and I'm looking, I put it in the show notes for anyone who, who's curious. Um, and what I see is that PFSense created a self-signed cert that I had asked pre that I previously asked Firefox to trust. And so it says the website is 192.168.0.1. And so that IP is in the cert and has to match in the same way that a normal certificate has a domain name, which has to match <laughs> this screenshot from windows XP. What is, <laughs> what is what it now, looks a Leo? little dated. <laughs> Just a little bit dated. I'm, I, I may be wrong, but uh... Uh, it's uh, Windows Seven. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. it's nice. Yeah. I like it. Anyway, I so, remember those days. Anyway, it, and then it says verified by, and the verified by where it would normally say, you know, Digicert, for example, it says PF Sense Web Configuration Self Signed Certificate. Anyway, so oh, and I I, I clicked on it. That self-signed certificate is valid from from uh, January 3rd of 2020 through January 25th of 2025. Mm. So that's not bad. That's four and a half years. That's a nice range. And that does suggest that self-signed certs are allowed to have a longer life than current certificate authority signed certificates, which are limited to 13 months. Remember, that's that 397 days. So anyway, I noted that Chrome was not happy with the PFSense self-signed certificate since I had not bothered to also tell Chrome to trust it, but I don't really care because I don't use Chrome that much. Anyway, there is a simple process for adding the certificate to Chrome's root trust store. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to go over that for background. I, I can't see any of the browsers removing the ability to add our own trust roots in the form of self-signed certificates. No, you have and to. And it's something you have that to. you only need. Yeah, exactly. And it's something you only need to do once for for the life of that certificate. So uh, it I would mean, be then nice. It, it is on you to go, whoa, th this is self-signed because it's my device as opposed right. to I'm out on the Internet and it's self-signed. My, right. my Synology lets me do either that or use Let's Encrypt. Uh, and I actually would prefer to use Let's Encrypt, but this, I have to open a port for it and blah, 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 blah. Uh, kind of, exactly. It's kind of annoying. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to have a, a, a public domain name on the Internet in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yep. Which I do, and I do. But then the script that it runs has to get out through that port and blah, blah, blah. Yep. So yep. Uh, I just use a self-signed certificate. Yeah. yeah. Or, or you just say, no, the, you know, in, in fact, on, for, for me, I just said, yeah, I don't care if the Synology NAS ha, ha, has a red slash through the padlock because, right. Right. you know, I'm happy to talk to it on HTTP. It's, I mean, it's I'm looking at it. It's sitting right here next to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the Internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. You already knew all that. What you may not know is that TwitNow has a show dedicated to it, The Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Hope to see you there.